A Brief History of Financial Welding. Welding, writes the artist Ian Chang, is the unnatural art of creating an infinite game by choosing its present, storytelling its past, simulating its futures, and nurturing its changes. As a maker of simulations, Chang's definition is willfully ambiguous as to which world is at stake. Without a definite article, a world of the world, it invokes a self-contained system, a garden complicit in its own making and unmaking. To replace the definite article and return to the fabric of reality as such, welding happens both in and of the world. Like a map that reconfigures the territory, welding is most both a projection of new spaces of inhabitation and the world's ongoing transformation of itself and its subjects. One could speak of welding as the transformation of conceptual technologies, such as time, nature, or value, which order a social, ontological, and epistemological reality. As the late anthropologist David Graeber wrote, the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it's something we make and could just as easily make differently. This, the disorientations of this transformation are felt acutely in times of catastrophic uncertainty and its attendant narrative collapses, where the welding of a world entails a new sense of time and a reorganization of concepts. What sense of time emerges from our own era of narrative uncertainty? The contemporary resonates with a post-catastrophic temporality, perhaps, to borrow as in which, to borrow Erna Esposito's phrase, we have used up all our futures, where the future is not here yet, but it's already been distributed. By examining the shifting modes of temporal organization and speculative imagination across financial history, by identifying finance as itself a welding technology, we might better understand how a world could be made otherwise. Suhail Malik and Amon Arvanesian characterize the temporality of financialization as, the t as, a t ah, as a speculative to time complex, in which linear time has been retooled into a plethora of alternative grammars, such as the preemptive, recursive, performative, cybernetic, mimetic, and other nonlinear configurations of cause and consequence. Similarly, Within the speculative logic of financial welding, the future is not an expectation, but a fiction to be indexed and occupied. Um, this part is mostly situated in the 18th century, so I'm just going to begin with a couple of quotes. Whatever we mean by modernity is in some way linked with new attitudes toward the control of the future and life relatively secure from the disruptions of chance. Lorraine Dustin. A uh, longer one from Kozlik. Since the French Revolution, concepts no longer merely serve to define a given state of affairs. They reach into the future. Increasingly, concepts of the future were created. Positions to be captured had first to be formulated linguistically before it was even possible to enter and formally occupy them. The substance of many concepts was thus reduced in terms of actual experience, and their aspirations to realization proportionately increased. Actual, substantial experience and the space of expectations coincide less and less. It's Reinhard Kozilek. Between Kozilek and Dastan's accounts, accounts of post-enlightenment temporality, you could maybe see two related concepts of the future emerge. For Dastan, it's a future that can be controlled relative to the insecurities of chance, a statistical ordering of the world and time to be insured, wagered, and hedged against. For Kozilek, it is the emergence of a constructionist count of the future, which must exist in the vi virtual before it can be entered into the horizon of the actual. To borrow Frank Knight's formulations, an uncertainty is rendered rhetorically into a risk, an unknown unknown into a candidate for worldly knowledge and reason. We might call the former an actuarial temporality, and the latter something like a prophetic, prefigurative one. They're two sides of the same speculative coin. While the former negotiates the appearance of an uncertain world into a matrix of probabilities, the latter brings new worlds to bear on the horizon by rearranging perceptions. Where the actuary manages expectation, the prophet collectivizes desire. 
The modern risk universe emerged from a shift in the relationship to time and money in the European Enlightenment over the 17th and 18th centuries. Theories of probability, like the law of large numbers, first theorized in Jacob Bernoulli's Ars Conjectandi, made way for events in time to be understood in terms of their underlying patterns. The arts of conjecture, or opinion, was reformulated as a quantitative relationship between certainty and uncertainty, as a moral relationship between sin and redemption, as an effective juxtaposition between unbridled desire and reasonable expectation. For instance, usury, the practice of money lending and charging interest, was once considered both sinful and illegal to Christian morality. As Thomas Aquinas had it, making money from lending money was tantamount to creating something from nothing, and only God could do that. With the emergence of a new statistical order, jurors argued that loans represented a calculable risk to the lender. To charge interest took on a reasonable, even redemptive quality of sound judgment. In order to do so, the temporality of risk laid the foundations for, the fina for finance as an arena of control and contestation of futures. In his essays around the same time, the novelist Daniel Defoe remarks approvingly of the new mutual insurance societies. Quote, General peace might be secured all over the world by it. All the contingencies of life might be fenced against in this method, as fire already is. As thieves, flood by land, storms by sea, losses of all sorts, and death itself. This reframing of contingency also ex saw an explosion of financial innovations, lotteries, insurance schemes, tontines, and scams. French debts, in particular, had mostly been taken out in the form of life annuities. In this scheme, the creditor sold the promise of a future annual income in exchange for a lump sum payment to the creditor, in this case, the French state. You can, you can pay 10,000 livres on the longevity of someone's life. Say this person could be your child, your relative, or the pope and the state paid you back in fixed percentages until the end of that life. In the decades before the French Revolution, these annuities had become so popular that Louis XVI used them to finance much of his indebted treasury. In one infamous scheme, the Thirty Virgins of Geneva, the bankers and noblemen of the Swiss capital issued annuities on the heads of their daughters and spread their risk by packaging them into a financial security, not dissimilar from a mortgage-backed security. The resulting product was so popular that Voltaire complained that Geneva was becoming more po uh, better known for annuities than for Calvin. As Rebecca Spang writes, if in some horrible conflagration the entire female population of Geneva had perished simultaneously, it might have been as much as 40% of the French monarchy's short-term borrowing that was redeemed in an instant. While seemingly unorthodox, the Thirty Virgins were reflective of a way in which futurity was bound up with notions of credit fundamentally rooted in social security, with their exceptionally privileged status and the spread of risk across their numbers in turbulent pre-revolutionary days. The lives of the Thirty Girls were amongst the surest bets in Europe. The speculative financial innovations of the 18th century foregrounded a, fact, foregrounded a fracturous dynamic between money and narrative vis-a-vis -vis reality. Mary Poovey argues that the emergence of paper money played a key role in the development of an eventual breakup of the continuum between fact and fiction. In the speculative wilderness of the early finance, in order to distinguish between valid and invalid forms of paper money, people needed to develop new ways of reading that grew in tandem with print culture and new forms of writing, especially in or about the market mania. Money, in a sense, became a mediator for the development of factual validity. Puvi observed that in moments of speculative crisis, such as the South Sea bubble of 1720, the continuum ceased to matter because every share attained its value, not from some underlying game by the company it represented, but also from the desire of other buyers to purchase the company's stocks. Like narrative fiction, speculative investment involves a suspension of, just, uh, of disbelief, where a fact is upheld so long as others believe it too. In the movement of collective belief to manifestation, worlding is far less concerned with facts than with whether belief can be suspended until a prophecy is fulfilled. As a fellow traveler on the fact-fiction continuum, money proved an ideal ve vehicle for this journey. The statistical disenchantment of one world was a revelation of another, more turbulent economic imaginary. 
By the 19th century, far from a control of the future imagined by Defoe, the financialized market economy began to resemble something more like a turbulent weather system, subject to inexplicable catastrophe. The 19th century economist Lord Overstone believed that the mysterious economic cycles repeated roughly every t decade, entering its lows with the emergence of disease credit owing to faith in things unseen. In the years before the French Revolution, the proto-abolitionist priest Abbe Renal wrote, the crimes of the kings and the sufferings of people will render universal this fatal catastrophe, which must detach one world from another, foretelling that Europe may someday find its masters and its children. This is a picture of the uh, Haitian revolutionary Toussaint Louverture, who had a copy of, um, had a bust of Abbe Renal in his study, and this is a kind of curious print that shows him reading Renal, apparently. And so the financial crises, <coughs> the era of financial crisis was born at the height of the European colonialism. And the collective fervor of speculation was also bound up with that most fundamental of narrative fictions, the nation. The Panic of 1825, arguably the first commercial crisis, was tied up with speculation in London over the debt instrument of new nations, such as Venezuela, Bolivia, and Peru, which had recently won their independence from the Spanish. One episode involving this financing, oh, one episode involved the financing of an entirely fictional nation, Poye. Its protagonist, Gregor McGregor, was a Scottish mercenary who had fought under the liberator of America, Simon Bolivar, as well as the future president of Venezuela, Jose Paez, firmly cementing his position as a member of the revolutionary elite uh, of these fledgling South American states. Having witnessed the flood of speculative capital pouring into new American sovereignties, McGregor formed financial admissions of his own. In 1820, he found himself at the court of King George Frederick Augustus, an indigenous leader of the people of the Mosquito Coast in contemporary northern Honduras. The part British indigenous king granted McGregor use of a swampy stretch of Mosquito territory. By his own decree, McGregor assumed the role of the cazique, or sovereign prince, of this new land, Poye, which was roughly the size of Wales. McGregor arrived in London in 1821, just as feverish investment into Latin America had begun to take hold. He'd come to sell Poyesian assets, loans, and acres of Poyesian land to financial investors and would-be settlers alike. To this end, McGregor established an elaborate alternative reality, a state composed almost entirely on paper. For Poyer, he had designed a flag, elaborate army uniforms, minted a currency, drawn up a constitution, and made a coat of arms. In Britain, he set up diplomatic offices and commissioned a lengthy publication entitled the sketch of the, A Sketch of the Mosquito Shore, which detailed the natural riches of Poye, quote, chiefly for the use of setters. The sketch described its lush flora, fauna, and mineral wealth. The land was said to be so abundantly fertile that a farmer could have three maize harvests every year. He could not have launched this scheme at a better time. As investments in this new, newly established sovereignty, as investments in the newly established sovereignties of Peru, Chile, and Colombia soared, Poesian bonds and land grants appeared as similarly credible investments in a distant, resource-rich territory to be exploited. Between 1822 and 23, about 200 years ago now, over 250 British settlers sailed for 40 days to the Mosquito Coast, carrying fistfuls of McGregor's own fiat currency, the Poye dollar which he had printed at the Royal Mint of Scotland, and which, for which they had sold their assets. On arrival at the Poesian capital, St. Joseph, the colonists, or would-be settlers, found a marshland and little more. Most of them died of tropical disease. A few were rescued to Jamaica, and only a dozen returned to Britain. The Poyer scheme was one of the most audacious security frauds in the history of finance. It was also an exercise in financial welding par excellence. McGregor's scheme worked not simply because of except his exceptional powers of persuasion, but because his desirous fiction hitched parasitically on the conjunction of ev other, even more pressing historical drives. From the hunger for returns on high-risk foreign, foreign debt assets in London, to the proliferation of new sovereignties, the mirage of Poirier was magnified by the convergence of multiple imaginaries. Many of the colonists who sailed from Edinburgh to Poye were themselves displaced peoples, 
Scottish crofters who had been dispossessed during the Highland clearances. Together, these vectors of financial, cultural, and effective investment were enough to bind an elaborate fabulation into a latent reality, a terrain to be expected in order to be inhabited, and was soon enough constrained through financial investments, such as a, a reality otherwise would be unthinkable. In particular, the scheme struck at the ambiguity at the heart of finance and nationhood, elusive notions whose substance allied between legal fictions, social imaginaries, and material facts. In Benedict Anderson's well-known formulation, a nation is an imagined political community, conceived as a solid community moving steadily down history, imagined as a coherent collectivity despite the fact that a member will never encounter more than a handful of their compatriots. A financialized reality speculates on the desires of others, converging expectations on the exchange into the figure of price, which becomes a mediator for collective desire itself. To colonial speculators on the London Stock Exchange, during a period of geopolitical, narr collapse, geopolitical narrative collapse, was Poirier any more factual or fictional investment than Venezuelan or Peruvian bonds? Put another way, was Poirier a scam or merely a suspension of disbelief, an exercise in collective delusion that is itself a prerequisite for a nation? Arguably, it was both. Having witnessed the fact of new nations emerging from revolutionary fictions, McGregor challenged the foment of colonial speculation to a, into a fiction of his own. For two short years between the coronation of the Cazique and the arrival of British settlers on its shores, Poirier seemed real enough. The media theorist Lars Ole Sauerberg identifies the 16th century as the beginning of the Gutenberg parenthesis, a period during which, uh, during which the advent of print media replaced the primarily oral culture. This medieval form of cultural transmission, in which information was spread through stories, rumor, performance, was disrupted by the emergence of the book, an infinitely, an infinitely replicable container of a canonical text. This era, Sauerberg and Tom Pettit suggest, is coming to an end, positing that the future is medieval. The textual authority of the book as a technology of containment is undone. Instead, what we see in the networks of a post-parenthetic digital culture is something more akin to a folkloric oral culture of the Middle Ages. It is unlikely, therefore, after all, that anything that exists on the internet today will outlast a single printed volume. In the technoculture of the early 21st century, narratives come and go with multiple cycles of intrigue and outrage playing out on the feed each day an increasingly rapid and self-conscious process through which threads of financial incorporation are understood to pull in all directions. Speculation, after all, is a two-way street. Just as investors seek to speculate in, on and influence the belief of, and desires of the collective, investees also become brutally aware of their own status as latent assets, elementary particles in the mimetic circuitry of social and financial capital. Here, collective desire and the power to marshal it is always already a vector of financial investment, and vice versa. The philosopher Michel Fayre invokes the politics of counter-speculation through the collectivization of investee power, analogous to the cartels formed by trade unions over the price of labor. Whether through the rise of self-employment, the precaritization of labor, or the decline of social welfare, to participate in the contemporary economy is, to be at very least, an entrepreneur of the self. Everyone speculates, albeit the returns on investments are powerfully asymmetrical. Fair's insight here is that because investors speculate on the desires and expectations of the collective, investees must collectivize their desires in order to, quote, participate for its own purposes in this game of self-fulfilling prophecies, and, quote, to occupy the time that creditors have conquered. In short, such investee activism it's about building collective leverage over investors and forcing them to reevaluate their portfolios, to become the risk they want to see in the world, and to preemptively dispossess investors of future returns, to take back the time that's been stolen. Fandoms and other avatars of collective desire have emerged in the platform era as powerful collectives in the financialized cultural landscape, where social visibility is itself a latently investable asset. Whether around a public figure, a conspiracy theory, a political cause, a campaign to cancel or defund, a transient subculture, a, a transient subculture forms into a leviathan determined to bend the flows of attention, discourse, and capital. 
like a crossbreed of like a crossbreed of social media influencers, activist investors, and political movements. Such avatars can play a powerful role in shaping the political economy of rep reputation, representation, and vibe. Unlike trade unions, however, their solidarity emerges typically not through sustained material conditions, but rather through a more ephemeral and capricious emotional force of adulation, resentment, and wrath. In this sense, they're not too solid at all. Like bait balls around the carcass, most of them diffuse as quickly as they form. The ones that do sustain momentum typically, con typically congeal their curiosity and kinship around densely woven bodies of communal law. As an emotional arc ripples through a network, a liquid discourse is simmered down into memes, perhaps the defining cultural containers of a post-parenthetic post canon. They form something like a speculative engine, fueled by propulsive forces of dopamine and FOMO, drawing ever more investors into its promise of latent capitalization. To be sure, these strategies are symbiotic with the monetization of mimetic desire by platform capitalism. With, increasingly self, uh, with, in, with increasing self-awareness among its individuals as precarious stakeholders in the financialized system, such strategies may still offer potent and perhaps inevitable processes by collect which collective forces mobilize. In a complete market, derivative theorists tell us, quote, there is a price for every asset in every possible state of the world, where every risk is hedged and the truth or price of every asset is discovered frictionlessly. In a society increasingly bound up with the consequences and cultural logics of markets, finance functions as an indexical engine, endlessly proliferating new linkages between credits, creditors and debtors, investors and investees, prices and expectations. This engine seems fueled by a fantasy of capture. At first, the capture of space by time, then time by contingency. The recursive, the recursive generation of uncertainty, information, and difference. A world derives its value, naturalizes itself, through its capacity to operationalize and deficit and desire, the de <coughs> and through the depths of its temporal imagination, the richness of its promise as a future to be occupied. In the alternative history, the Poirier settlers almost found the resources they needed to establish a new colonial nation McGregor himself eventually fled, eventually fled to Caracas, where he was recuperated as a hero of the independence war and welcomed on with a military pension for the rest of his life. Contemporary forms of counter speculation could be seen as a metastasis, not a departure, from a longer history of financial welding. As Toby Shore and Laura Lotti and Sam Hart of Other Internet write about the crypto space, Quote, at inception, tokens are neither digital stores of value nor equities. They are simply promises that attract an audience, end quote. For many, it is a reckoning of, with power driven by a mixture of hope, desire, and resentment. To build new structures in the body of the old requires disparate and uneasy alliances, able to bind together and steer technical, cultural, and effective economic currents. And as the media scholar Christian McRae noted at the height of the last crypto boom, a thirst for reclaiming ownership in a world that doesn't let you own anything, own anything should not be underestimated. That's, that's everything from me. I'm gonna, I don't know how long that was, but I'm gonna step away now. See you later.